All right, in this video, I'm going to talk about yellow fever and dengue. Um, while these are not as, I don't know, sensational as Ebola and Marburg, which have been in the news a lot for causing hemorrhagic fever viruses, um, these guys both can. Um, I, I'm covering to them together and kind of separately because they seem to have a lot of things in common. For one, they're both flaviviruses, so they fall in the same family. So we can kind of think of their life cycle and replication as one. Okay, so also they have a mosquito vector. Um, so that means they're arboviruses. So whenever we're dealing with an arbovirus, we already know that kind of one of the best ways to avoid contracting it is to avoid the arthropod. Um, so that's number one. Pretty much all of the flaviviruses are arboviruses, except for hepatitis C. Um, hepatitis C we'll talk about when we talk about all of the other hepatitis viruses. Um, but at this point, all you really need to know about it is that like based on structure and replication it's a flavivirus but it has this major difference in from all of the other flaviviruses in that it is not um, an arbovirus so as far as flaviviruses go they're all enveloped viruses they have a plus sense single-stranded rna genome um, the main ones we're going to talk about here are yellow fever and dengue virus. We'll talk about West Nile virus, St. Louis encephalitis virus um, in your brain behavior and cognition block, um, mainly because they both kind of have a predilection for causing encephalitis. That's also where we'll talk about Japanese encephalitis virus. Um, I mention tick-borne encephalitis or Powassan virus. Um, in your notes. This is largely endemic to Russia. Um, I don't really talk about it very much, um, just kind of an honorable mention as part of the family. Um, Zika I cover in a separate video, mainly because Zika is not associated with hemorrhage. It is associated with undifferentiated fever, um, microcephaly, and Guillain-Barre, but not hemorrhage. So it uh, does not have that special symptom that we're going to talk about in this video that yellow fever and dengue virus actually share. All right, so let's start with yellow fever. Um, yellow fever actually is a pretty serious condition. It's got about a 30% mortality rate. Um, it is, as I mentioned, it's an arbovirus. It's actually one of those viruses that is transmitted by the Aedes aegypti um, mosquito. Um, it can also actually be transmitted by the Culex mosquito, which is bad news for us, right? Because the Culex is all over the United States, whereas the Aedes aegypti is on the road north. So either way, um, we do have kind of high vector exposure to yellow fever. Um, there is both a sylvatic and an urban cycle for yellow Yellow fever. So what does that mean? That means that when we get infected with yellow fever, we have really high viremia. Okay, so that means since we have high viremia, we're able to go ahead and infect another mosquito, which can go ahead and infect another human. Um, and that's how we get that urban cycle. Um, this one is one of those ones that's found all over the world. Um, currently, it's found in like 47 countries. Um, most notably, we tend to associate it with Africa and Central and South America. And that's kind of where it's considered to be endemic. Um, all of these countries have regions that are endemic to yellow fever virus, not like it's all over. Um, in 2013, the World Health Organization actually reported 84,000 to 170,000 severe cases and between 29,000 to 60,000 deaths in Africa alone. So this is still a major health concern worldwide. And I mean, that makes sense because it has such a high mortality and really the control of it is controlling the vector. Um, so we don't really tend to see this one in the U.S. too often. When we see it, it's because of travelers. This is another one of those traveler illnesses. So travelers returning from some of these endemic areas may bring the disease to countries that are free of yellow fever. Um, there is actually a vaccine for yellow fever currently, um, which we'll talk about in the middle in a minute. It's the Tyler 17D vaccine. 
Um, so vaccine can be really incredibly important. Um, in past centuries, specifically the 17th and 19th century, um, yellow fever was a big deal in the United States. Uh, it was transported to North America and Europe, where it caused large outbreaks that disrupted economies, development, and in some cases decimated populations. Um, so this has a biphasic disease course. The incubation period for the first stage is about one to six days. Um, following the arthropod bite. So you get bit by a mosquito, six days later, boom, undifferentiated fever. Um, a lot of patients are asymptomatic, but some people may develop symptoms like fever, nausea, vomiting, muscle pain, um, and uh, backache and headache are also common. So just kind of that uh, full body arthralgia, loss of appetite, which makes sense with all the nausea and vomiting. Um, in most cases, about three to four days later, they're gonna get better, basically a bad viral infection. Um, however, a percentage of patients uh, will move on to that second stage. So six days after the bite, they get sick, they have a really bad couple of days, three to four days, they start to feel better, then 24 hours later, second stage, here we go. Um, second stage is a lot worse. Um, this is a much more severe stage. Approximately 30 to 50% of patients who enter this second stage will die within seven to 10 days. Um, so basically they get a high fever returning, a venous stasis, marked tendency to hemorrhage. So that's where we get that hemorrhagic fever. Bleeding can occur from pretty much anywhere, eyes, nose, mouth, stomach. Um, patients will produce this black vomit. Um, why? Uh, well, so blood is red and then it mixes with bile in your stomach and that turns it black. So you get this black vomit. Um, you also can um, get prostration, kidney involvement, renal dysfunction. You also get degenerative changes in the liver, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and you get these things called councilman bodies, which show up. Um, and because you're getting changes in the liver, patients will often appear jaundiced, hence the term yellow fever. Um, so you can also see heart dysfunction. So it, it kind of just goes everywhere. So what can we do about it? Um, not much. Um, supportive care, that's it. So, you know, keep fluids going, um, try to treat pain, avoid NSAIDs, right? Because um, this is a hemorrhagic fever. There is no specific treatment. All we can kind of say is good luck and support. Um, it's really found in these specific areas. So when a patient is traveling to those areas, you definitely wanna encourage them to get the vaccine. Um, it's the Tyler 17D vaccine. Tyler is actually a virus, um, but they're actually using this viral backbone to vaccinate for another. It's a very effective and affordable live attenuated vaccine. So that's important to note. This is a live attenuated vaccine. Um, Step loves for you to know the live vaccines. So keep that in mind. Coverage is pretty low in high risk areas. So prompt recognition and control of an outbreak is really important because that's the only way we can use max mass vaccination. Um, there are two groups of people that we should be careful of, specifically pregnant women and infants. Um, you're gonna wanna watch vaccinating them because like I said, it is a live vaccine. So we, we don't really vaccinate them unless there's an active epidemic going on. Um, the other group of people that should be avoided are patients with severe egg allergies because it's actually inoculated um, in chicken eggs. So they can actually have a response, a severe allergic response. Um, the other best thing you can do here is control the mosquito population. That's kind of your best bet. Um, cause if you can control the mosquito population, you can actually control the virus pretty effectively. Okay. So these are those councilman bodies that I was talking about. Um, they, uh, actually show up in the liver tissue of patients infected with yellow fever. Um, these are basically inclusions and an inclusion is basically just an excess of material inside the cell it's attacking. So with viruses, it's either extra nucleic acid or protein that basically just piles up uh, inside the cell um, and causes an inclusion. Um, so there are various different types of inclusions you can get. So like for instance, like smallpox, uh, which I'm not showing here, uh, produces guanary bodies. And there's a really simple way to remember this one. It's a bad joke, ready? You can remember that smallpox makes guanary bodies. 
because it's all gone. Guan. Bad pun. I know. Um, rabies causes negri bodies. Herpes causes cowdry type A bodies. And yellow fever gives you councilman bodies. Okay, so this is kind of where yellow fever is currently found. And you can see that the World Health Organization actually kind of gives recommendations as to whether or not you should receive the yellow fever vaccine based on where you're traveling. So um, if you have travelers arriving from a yellow fever risk country, you know, these are the countries you're definitely want to go going to want to get vaccinated for. And then if your patients have traveled to a yellow fever risk country, you're going to want to put it on your kind of differential list. If they're arriving from some of these uh, countries that are kind of in a darker yellow, it's going to bump up a bit, right? Because those kind of have a higher risk of that. You can see that currently we don't really have it in the United States, but it is certainly in Central America. Um, but it used to be a big deal in the United States. It used to be a big deal kind of like here in the United States in the 1800s. And I'm going to tell you a fun story about our own Benjamin Rush. Um, so Benjamin Rush, Rush was a physician in the 18th century in Philadelphia. So time and place are right on for Benjamin Rush to make a big deal. Um, he was there signing, you know, our Declaration of Independence, where our forefather was obviously present because he was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. So it's July. It's 1793. Philly is hot, really hot. It's having a drought. Now, what happens to mosquitoes in a drought? The water goes away. Do they go away? No, mosquitoes need water. That's where they lay their eggs and do all of their, um, their reproducing. So all the water sources dried up and the mosquitoes said, you know who has water? Humans. And the mosquitoes went inland to hang out with us and all of our plentiful water. Now, at that time, we also had a major influx of refugees from the West Indies because there was this epidemic disease happening in the West Indies. And there was also a giant kind of war happening between the native West Indy residents and the French. So a whole bunch of West Indy uh, residents were like, let's get out of here and head to Philly. So something like 2,000 refugees basically descended on Philly. That same month, the first cases of yellow fever appeared along the waterfront in Philly. The people that were first affected were transients, immigrants, and the poor. So most of the medical establishment largely ignored them, but not our Benjamin Rush. He saw some of the first cases in early August, and he decided that the city was in the early stages of an epidemic of bilious remitting yellow fever, and he made a public announcement. Well, he was immediately ridiculed for being a fear-mongering alarmist, but did he stop? No. He told the mayor and the governor, and he asked Philly's College of Physicians to convene to come up with an action plan. And when everybody finally listened to him at the end of August, only half of the members came to the meeting. And they agreed that Russia's report that basically encouraged good cleanliness, reducing contact with the sick, and other basic health guidelines. Well, by the end of August, people were fleeing the city. During that epidemic Rush that Rush spotted so early, there were over 4,000 deaths. Thomas Jefferson, who left town, by the way, I guess he wasn't a doctor, estimated that about 33% of the infected patients died. Some of Philly's docs fled, including many of the most prominent. Of those that stayed, 10 of them died. Our Dr. Rush did stay, and he did not die. He died in 1813 of a different organism we'll talk about called typhus fever, um, which is actually a rickettsial bacterial infection, also super infectious. Stay tuned for that video. All right, enough with the history lesson. As much fun as history is, let's go back to viruses. So we've kind of finished talking about yellow fever. So at this point, you should have figured out that yellow fever is kind of a big health concern. But actually, the most common flavivirus in the world is this guy, dengue virus. Um, it is the most common arbovirus. You can see it's got a huge map, um, and it even does creep up. You're not really seeing it here, but it is. Um, it was found on Hawaii, um, and there have been some cases in Florida for the last several years. Um, this is a fairly close relative of yellow fever. Um, there are kind of two separate diseases, and those are based on serotypes. 
Um, it's pretty unlikely to become a major epidemic in the U.S. because we kind of lack the jungle sylvatic cycle. However, you can find it here. Uh, Texas, South California, Florida, specifically the Florida Keys. Key West has had an outbreak for about five to six years now. Um, it does seem to be more controlled now, but we've been finding dengue in Key West pretty reliably each year. Um, and the infection rate is increasing as dengue spreads to new areas. Um, local transmission has even been reported outside the US in kind of uncommon places like France and Croatia. Um, so these are not places that we typically associate with mosquitoes, but they are unfortunately um, having to deal with some of these. Um, and it's been imported cases in three other countries. Um, there was actually an outbreak in Portugal that led to over 2000 cases. Um, and actually I circle Hawaii here because in 2015, there was one case of dengue, just one. And the local tourism board went into a panic. They were going to find that one mosquito and kill that mosquito wherever it was. They were ready to like nuke the entire southern half of the big island. But thankfully, all they had to do was nuke it with mosquito poison, and then it was fine. Um, last year, there were two locally transmitted cases of dengue, one in Florida and one in Alabama. So we are seeing it here um, as kind of life moves on. Um, so it's once again, we find it in the female Aedes aegypti. I don't think I've said this so far, but the Aedes aegypti that spreads most of these is um, a female. And the reason is the Aedes aegypti male can live really happily on fruit, but the female, the female needs your blood to grow her young. Yep. She is bloodthirsty because she's trying to make more. And so it's actually the female mosquito that's spreading all of these things. Um, it has a four to 10 day incubation in that mosquito. So if I have dengue and the mosquito bites me, it's gonna be four to 10 days before that mosquito can transmit dengue to you. Um, and like I said, there's increasing incidents all over the world. Um, dengue is painful. So the first time you get dengue, it's very painful and it, it manifests as this thing that's called break bone fever. So you're still talking about that undifferentiated fever, but the arthralgia and myalgia are supposed to be so intense that it feels like every bone in your body is breaking. The fever portion of it can be kind of biphasic. Um, and you actually see that the white blood cell count and the, place, the platelet cell count might be reduced in some patients. Um, it is a really severe flu-like illness that affects affects infants, young children, and adults, but even though it's incredibly painful, dengue fever alone doesn't normally cause death. What causes death is dem dengue hemorrhagic fever. Now, here's how dengue hemorrhagic fever works. Let's talk about kind of the um, associated symptoms with dengue hemorrhagic fever first. Um, basically, dengue hemorrhagic fever will start with kind of a potentially deadly complica uh, com uh, complication that is really due to plasma leak leakage, so basically edema. Um, and that's kind of what leads to most of the symptoms we're gonna talk about. Um, so you get fluid accumulation, and if you get fluid accumulation in the wrong spots, like your lungs, that can lead to respiratory distress. You also get severe bleeding and organ impairment. So symptoms are gonna occur about three to seven days after the first symptoms. So you still get kind of this breakbone fever-like onset, but then in addition to that, now you've got, um, you know, difficulty breathing, severe bleeding, um, severe abdominal pain, persistent vomiting, rapid breathing because of the difficulty, bleeding gums, fatigue, restlessness, and once again, that black vomit, blood in the vomit. Um, dengue hemorrhagic fever only occurs the second time you contract dengue. And that is because of a phenomenon known as antibody-induced enhancement of infection. So let's talk about what that means again for a minute, okay? So dengue, there are actually kind of four types of dengue and they're named den one, den two, den three, and den four, okay? Now, these are all serotypes. So you have antibodies that are specific for each. So let's say the first time I get dengue, I have dengue one and I make antibodies to dengue one, okay? 
I'm going to recover from dengue one. It's going to hurt like heck, but I'm going to recover. These antibodies from the previous infection will always protect me against dengue one. They're going to do their job there. However, they're going to cross react with dengue two in such a way that they're going to help dengue two, if I were to encounter it, infect macrophages. And that is exactly what the virus wants. The virus wants to get into the macrophages. So it's when the patient contracts a different dengue serotype, be it two, three, four, doesn't matter. If the patient encounters a different serotype than they had before, the antibodies actually help the virus get into its target cell, which is the macrophage, and therefore you're actually promoting infection. So that's why it's called antibody induced because it relies on the antibodies from the previous exposure enhancement of infection. And that's what actually leads to the hemorrhagic symptoms that we see. So this is a child with dengue hemorrhagic fever. You can note the extensive hemorrhaging here. Um, it looks like bruising around the forehead and the eyes. You've got hemorrhagic conjunctiva. You've got these lesions. Um, this patient, you can actually see these kind of bullae um, that are forming here. The, the patient is actually kind of bleeding into the third space. That's how um, extensive the bleeding is. Okay, so what can we do about it? Um, supportive care, certainly. Um, anytime you have a hemorrhagic fever, you're going to want to make sure to push fluids and um, provide pain relief where you can. Again, do not give NSAIDs. It's going to actually um, promote hemorrhage, even if it does alleviate some pain. Um, so technically, I believe this is still true, that there's currently no approved vaccine. Um, when I checked this a couple of months ago, it did look like Dengvaxia was licensed and approved in several countries and that the World Health Organization actually recommends it, but I think the FDA is still kind of uh, here and there on it. Um, since we aren't really in an endemic area, I wouldn't expect that to change anytime soon, but it is something to think about as you're moving to um, or traveling to endemic areas or dealing with patients coming back from endemic areas, whether or not they've been vaccinated. And then the main thing, avoid the vectors, you know, um, use mosquito repellent, wear long sleeves. Um, there are also a variety of um, kind of experiments that are going on in a lot of countries using genetically sterilized mosquitoes to try to um, reduce the uh, mosquito burden, um, pesticides, insecticides, all of these will help you avoid dengue.